to the Neil Haley Show and Celebrity Interviews live from the Grotto with Greg Hanna. Greg, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing fantastic, Neil. How are you? And I'm, I tell you, I'm always excited to have amazing guests on and, you know, what could be better than having a Kennedy on our show today? Yeah, that's one thing. I guess when I started our guest today is Patrick Kennedy that ever interview a Kennedy when I started 15 years ago doing this. And I've interviewed a lot of amazing people. But, you know, when you talk about the Kennedy family, Patrick, it's it goes on forever, isn't it? And the, 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 the stories, right? Well, I, again, thank you, Neil and Greg, for having me on. I appreciate the chance to talk about my my new book profiles and mental health courage. And, uh, yeah, you know, I've been blessed in my life to have a family name that helped me get elected, obviously helped me be successful in politics. And, uh, what I did with it was uh, really push this mental health parity and addiction equity act, um, which is personal to me as someone who's in recovery myself from addiction. Um, the law prohibits insurance companies from discriminating against people with these illnesses and uh, since leaving Congress, I've uh, fought to see that that law gets fully enforced and implemented. And uh, I've, I've really enjoyed being on the outside of politics today, just trying to help uh, organize a political movement so we get the change we need and get people in this country the care they need. Well, that's great. So you, you just mentioned uh, the fact that you're recovering yourself. So is that the reason that... Uh... But the impetus for having you to write the book, or was there another reason behind that? Or, well, you know, I was early in my political career, and uh, the fellow that I had been in drug rehab with uh, in high school sold his story to the National Enquirer, saying that he was in rehab with the Kennedy. So there was a big picture of me. Uh, I was a newly elected um, legislator. Uh, Kennedy is a drug addict, so I had to. Mm try to survive that politically because of course back then it was worse in the way of stigma but my constituents in rhode island uh the only thing they hated worse than a drug addict was someone who ratted on a drug addict so i <laughs> uh, managed to uh prevail in the next election and then um uh, throughout my time in congress was uh, re-elected um you know yes i i uh, find that when i grew up my family suffered from uh tremendous trauma, uh, addiction, alcoholism, and we never talked about it. And uh, when I wrote my own narrative, the story of, of trying to get this parity law passed in Congress while also grappling with depression and addiction myself, um, I was really amazed at how little we still talked about it. In fact, when I came back from a DWI, which of course put me all over the newspapers again, I had dozens of my colleagues in Congress approach me to tell me about their own struggles. And of course, it, I, I realized that I'm the only one that they know has their illness. Because none of them, when they walk past each other in the Congress, knows that the other one is also someone who suffers from addiction. And mm. But because my addiction was so public, you know, I was the person that colleagues of mine from both the Senate and the House would would take me aside and tell me their own uh, stories. So I found that by putting this new book together, um, I could get people to tell their stories. Obviously, they're not really high profile people. There's a NFL football player and a, a grade A kind of uh, actress. Um, but but outside of that, it's just real people telling the real story of what it's like to live with these illnesses. I think if we have greater understanding as to how these illnesses really manifest, how do people cope with personal relationships when they have an illness or someone else has an illness, how do they uh, navigate the healthcare system? All of that, I think that if there's greater understanding, we all do better as a result, as a society. So. Um, my hope is to get more transparency so we can turn down the stigmatization of these illnesses. The more we know, the less we're going to get all hung up on, you know, how these illnesses uh, manifest. We may be sick uh, and of the uh, symptoms, but that doesn't mean we have to take it out on the people themselves who are really through no fault of their own. I mean, who gets up in the day and says, I'm going to try to get arrested I'm mm -hmm. going to try to piss off everyone in my family. 
I'm going to, you know, put my life at risk today by, you know, ingesting uh, drugs and alcohol. Like no one chooses that. And if you're psychotic, you don't choose to talk to yourself on the side of the street while people are looking at you. And yet mm. we have cast such a, a, a perception of those with these illnesses that we leave them on the street. We leave them in jail and we isolate them in our family. So uh, we have to get more comfortable with these illnesses and in doing so get to better treatment so that we don't have to have as many people suffer. I mean, frankly, we could dramatically reduce the number of people who are in, on our streets with open psychosis. I, I had the solution. It's not mine. It's experts. They, they have the solution. Coordinated specialty care when someone has their first incidence of psychosis. We could dramatically reduce the disability people have from these illnesses if you interrupt the disease early in its process. Wow. It's not, yeah. That's just like we treat every other illness. We don't wait till cancer gets to be stage four until we treat it. And we shouldn't do that when it comes to mental illness or addiction either. And we should start early in the identification. I think that's the other biggest mistake we make is we people that could have the potential of having PTSD, the potential of some sort of mental illness needs to be identified early so we can get the treatment because treatment can help. That's the, the issue that we still have not been able to fix as, as, as a country is treatment will help uh, people get through this. We know what works. We just don't often pay for it. And we frankly don't often deploy it, you know, nearly half of those who are providers do not use evidence-based therapies in treating their patients. For example, they get theoretical degrees, but if it's an eating disorder patient here or complex grief over there or trauma over here or depression over there, there's different modalities of treatment. And yet we expect a one size fits all approach to treat all of them the same. And the, frankly, it's not the same. There are specific aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy that work especially well for different types of diagnoses. And we just need to treat this like we would other diseases. We do not have the focus we need to have on, on treating these illnesses. Greg, what next question you have for Patrick? Yep. Uh, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> uh, Patrick, what uh, steps do you feel society as a whole can take to reduce the stigma around mental health and addiction? Well, I, again, the reason I did the book is because we have people today, thankfully willing to say that they have a diagnosis or that they get help or that they're in recovery, but we don't really know much more than that. We don't know what does treatment look like? How do people uh, manage without getting the best treatment? Like how do they live their lives? That's something that I hope if, if it becomes easy for people to understand, then they're less judgmental, they're less fearful of it. It's, uh, you know, if it's mysterious, people get scared. If, if they see it and it's transparent, it's easy for them to start to wrap their arms around and say, well, how can we do something to address this? Hmm. So that's what I'm hoping. I'm also hoping that we enforce uh, the law that I had a chance to write, which is the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, because if we normalize screening and treatment, then people won't think of it as any big deal, like having to go down to see the mental health professional, because they'll just see it as part of healthcare. And that's what will really blast stigma out of the water is when this becomes second nature to people. When they go to the doctor, they get treated for any mental health conditions along with their diabetes, which by the way, you're not going to treat diabetes if you're still drinking. Because yeah. you're all, or you're not going to treat depression effectively uh, or get treatment for heart disease if you're not also treating depression. And it can go on and on. We, we just so siloed mental health and taking it outside the house of medicine. Um, people are dying of these illnesses and not just in suicide and overdose, but they're dying of heart attacks that could have been prevented if we had treated the underlying depression or other um, conditions that are exacerbated by untreated depression, anxiety, and uh, addiction. All right. So Greg has a question. He asks all his celebrity guests. Go ahead with that question. Great. Yeah, I really appreciate this. It, real quick before I, before I do that, um, let me just ask you one other quick question. You know, for those people that, you know, really want to advocate, whether they're an individual or an organization, do you have any 
quick advice for them, um, how they can help advocate for uh, better mental health policies? Well, on the back of my book, I have a alignment for progress is the name of the website. We have a QR code to a national public policy agenda that we, if we got our policymakers to adopt, we could help make a big difference in this space. It means that we need to adopt better housing policies, better human services policies, better criminal justice policies, you know, better um, you know, healthcare as well. It, we need a comprehensive approach. So it's not just one simple fix. We need to really get sophisticated in our approach. And we need to tell our elected officials that we vote on this. And frankly, we're the biggest special interest group in the country, but nobody knows us because we're still so anonymous and, and we're still so silent. Um, but I, I remember that Godfather movie you know where he said we're bigger than u.s steel yeah. like mental health and addiction you add up everybody who suffers from it you add up their family members you add up the people who provide the care we are the biggest special yeah. interest group in the country however if i'm running for office i don't see those votes when i calculate my political strategy if mm -hmm. i could see that the third half of my constituents were publicly identifying themselves as someone who cared about mental health, you can bet as a politician, I'm gonna design a political platform that addresses that interest. Um, so that's what we need to do in terms of advocacy. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you, Patrick. Been a real pleasure and an honor. And here's my question for you. Uh, I can't wait to hear the response. Um, what do you feel is the most important thing in life you've ever learned? Um, that I uh, get relief by helping other people. Like we, I, you know, so cultured to think, what am I going to get to make myself feel better? And I've learned that the real irony and paradox in life is by asking what I could do for someone else that I automatically get relief for myself without mm -hmm. even trying. That is uh, the foundation of recovery. You don't, you don't get it yourself until you give it away. Um, it's such a great paradox, but it's true. We only get relief and we only get our own spirits nurtured. We only get our own value as human beings, our own sense of purpose, if we're helping others uh, to find their purpose and to find their way out uh, from these illnesses. Because these illnesses aren't just medical illnesses. They're, they affect people's dignity, their spirit. And when we help people um, we're also helping them become who they are meant to be. And uh, there's something enormously uh, uplifting in that whole process. All right. Well, we appreciate it. You pitch up your book in all finer bookstores. Appreciate it, Patrick. Thanks for stopping by. And we Love appreciate you. the time. Thank you, Thank Patrick. Thank all right. you guys. Be well. All right. All right. That was a special simulcast of the Neil Haley Show and Celebrity Interviews live from the Grotto. Greg Hanna, guys. Take care.